The British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has told his Israeli counterpart Benjamin Netanyahu that the UK will stand by the country in what both men described as its darkest hour. During talks in Jerusalem, the Prime Minister said Israel had the right to defend itself after attacks by Hamas killed nearly 1,400 Israelis. The meeting came amid continuing concerns about the plight of people in Gaza. Rishi Sunak said Gazans were victims of Hamas as well and welcomed plans to get aid into the territory from Egypt. Aid agencies are warning that Gaza is in need of far more aid than the initial 20 lorries announced by President Biden during his visit to Israel yesterday. The UN humanitarian chief Martin Griffiths says about 100 lorries a day will be required. More than 60 international charities, including Christian Aid, Oxfam and Save the Children, have called for an urgent ceasefire. Well, Israeli airstrikes are continuing in Gaza. The latest reports from Gaza say that several people, including children, have been killed or wounded in an airstrike on a house in the southern town of Khan Yunis. These are some of the pictures from the hospital nearby, with what appears to be UN workers among the injured. Well, Palestinian health officials said the death toll had risen to more than 3,800 Palestinians in total. Diplomatic meetings to try to secure aid for Palestinians are continuing, with the King of Jordan meeting Egypt's president in Cairo. Both countries have played significant mediation roles in previous conflicts. Well, coming up this hour, we'll hear from a UN agency on the ground. We'll also hear from a British man who's lost family members in Gaza and from the families desperately trying to trace loved ones seized by Hamas. First, though, we start with this report from Wira Davis. Hot on the heels of yesterday's visit by Joe Biden, a UK military flight today brought Rishi Sunak to Tel Aviv. The Prime Minister here to meet Israeli leaders and British-Israeli victims of the brutal violence of 12 days ago. On the well-travelled road to Jerusalem, Mr Sunak's trip is a symbolic show of solidarity after one of the worst events in modern Israeli history. Rishi Sunak's visit here and that of world leaders before and afterwards is to show Israel that its allies have its back. There may well be some calls for restraint, but what happens next is perhaps inevitable and they won't try to persuade Israel otherwise. Israel's military build-up on the border with Gaza continues. When they go in is perhaps yet to be decided, but with the avowed intention of completely destroying Hamas, those who've seen this before say this time will be different. The two previous uh, ground campaigns in 2014 and 2009 both lasted for about 18 days, and then the Israeli forces, which were there on the ground, left. This time it's going to be a heck of a lot longer than 18 days, and nobody is uh, going to say, whether it's say weeks, months, perhaps even years, until Israel has reached that uh, objective of eradicating Hamas leadership and military capabilities in Gaza. So that is really the main difference now. For now, Israel continues to hit targets inside Gaza from the air, confirming it had hit hundreds of Hamas infrastructure sites. But say Palestinian officials, there have also been numerous civilian casualties, many of them children. Gaza's humanitarian situation is dire. And like President Biden before him, Rishi Sunak impressed on Israeli leaders the importance of allowing limited aid into Gaza through the border with Egypt something Israel has agreed to and which should begin by the end of the week. Compared to its reliance on the United States for support and military aid, Israel's relationship with the UK is much less important. But at times of such crisis, these moments are significant. I'm proud to stand here with you in Israel's darkest hour as your friend. We will stand with you in solidarity. We will stand with your people and we also want you to win. This is not merely our battle, it's the battle of the entire civilized world. It's the battle of uh, Israel, it's the battle of the modern Arab countries, it's the battle of uh, Western civilization, the battle of the free world, the battle for the future. Israel says it cannot allow its friends or the wider world to forget what happened on October the 7th when 1,300 people were murdered. And on the day of Rishi Sunak's visit, British-Israeli Yoni Rappaport was the latest victim to be identified. Murdered in the attack on Kibbutz Beri, the lifetime Man United fan leaves behind two young children. Woodrow Davis, BBC News, Jerusalem.
Jerusalem. We talked to our correspondent Tom Bateman. Uh, these are the pictures live from Gaza, another huge plume of smoke there on the skyline. So let's bring in Tom Bateman, uh, has been across uh, all of today's developments. Uh, Tom, your assessment of that visit from Rishi Sunak the day after the American president? Well, it was meant to show a very strong uh, signal of solidarity by Mr Sunak and the British government for the Israeli leader uh, at this particular moment. But I thought what was interesting was that whereas we were hearing uh, towards the end of last week, uh, really only that message from the UK government, um, I think what we've seen, which was triggered largely by a tour by the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, of around eight Arab capitals, this rapid shuttle diplomacy at the end of last week, in which he kept adding new venues and, and dates and then coming back to Israel. That's where we saw some of the messaging from the Western powers start to shift a bit. And we have much more focus about the need to get humanitarian aid into Gaza and a bit more of an emphasis, too, which we heard from Rishi Sunak about the need for Israel to operate within the boundaries of international law. Um, because clearly what they are worried about here is the way that this has the potential to escalate and spread to the wider region. And remember that many, many millions of people across the rest of this region have been seeing those pictures coming from Gaza with this huge civilian um, death toll. And that is creating, uh, it's making the temperature rise. And so I think, you know, what we were hearing from Mr. Biden yesterday and Mr. Sunak a bit today uh, was the need to sort of show that they are urging some sort of restraint to the Israelis. Remember, we haven't even had, of course, that ground invasion begin yet. It's still expected. And I think one of the, the really one of the only practical ways they can try and do that at the moment is to try and alleviate some of the desperation in Gaza by getting that Rafah crossing open with Egypt. So that uh, messaging that, you know, the deal that was done between Mr. Biden and the Israelis yesterday, that they'll try to open, get Rafah opened tomorrow, which will allow in 20 aid trucks of uh, food, water and medicine, not fuel, though. And that is really um, crucial. And although uh, having said all of that, what we're hearing now from aid groups and the UN is it really not, that is just it will help, but it's not going to be anywhere near enough. Tom, a, a twin thought, uh, just a, a supplementary on where you finished. <clears throat> What have Israel said about where that aid may go? Are there any limitations? And in terms of the military build-up, where are we? Well, in terms of where the aid goes, I mean, the Israelis have said that there should be a designated uh, aid point, uh, a supply point for the uh, aid, which is on the coastal side of the Gaza Strip. But we, we really don't know much about the logistics at the moment. I mean, all we've heard, we heard from uh, an Egyptian official saying that they are working at the moment to repair the roads after the damage from the Israeli bombing um, close to the crossing, the, the, the part of the road that runs between the Egyptian side of the border and, uh, onto the sort of liaison point at Rafah with the um, Palestinian side. So they're working on that. Um, but beyond that, what exactly will happen to the aid, we simply don't know. I mean, one of the things the Israelis had been saying is uh, that, and one of the reasons they don't want fuel, is they have said that if there's any sense that supplies are being exploited or stolen by Hamas, they'll, they'll stop it. Um, so these are really going to be really sensitive discussions between all of the parties involved. As to the build up to war, we're not really any further in terms of what we know than we were, I think, at the beginning of this week, quite honestly. I mean, the, you know, the build-up around the perimeter of the Gaza Strip of Israeli forces has been absolutely huge. The biggest call-up of military reservists in half a century of 360,000 people. It is all a massive operation. It feels to me that while we've had this week, which has almost felt like a slight pause while um, international diplomacy has ramped up. You know, President Biden yesterday, we had uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, the German Chancellor, there may be more European leaders coming um, this week. It feels like it would be unlikely that a ground invasion would be launched during that. But of course, we simply don't know. These are unprecedented and extremely volatile um, times. Uh, but, you know, clearly they have been and they've been saying since the weekend, the Israelis militarily, they're ready to go. Tom Bateman there in Jerusalem. Thanks very much.